Good evening and welcome here tonight to what is going to be a fantastic hour. And I have to say, Michael, that's the most beautiful book cover to look at, the most beautiful cover I've seen in ages. So tonight we're here to celebrate the publication of Michael Poland's new book, This Is Your Mind on Plants. And as I think you saw from the cover, it's about three very specific plants. It's about caffeine and it's about mescaline and it's about opium, but it's also about lots of other things, about why plants affect us and how they work and what they are to all of us. And I'm absolutely thrilled that we're joined tonight by Michael's friend um, and fellow extraordinary plant person. I'm not sure whether we call you that, Monty, but Monty Don, who is known and beloved of all audiences, both here and in the USA, and who himself has written extensively about plants. In fact, the last time Monty was on five, five by 15, we did a thing about his garden world, which is an incredible book, which I cannot recommend too highly, which really does take the nature and the life in your garden and makes you look at it as though you're in a, an African safari, which I always think is the greatest skill to make you see what's under your eyes. Now, we're going to talk for a bit, then we'll take questions. So do put the Q, in your questions into the Q&A. And we're all, of course, very interested to know how many of you will peel off towards the end to watch the football and quite what the intersection is between people who are interested in Monty and Michael, who also <laughs> want to see if England beats Denmark. Anyway, with no further ado, Michael, welcome from Berkeley, California, where I'm glad to hear you're not in a heat wave, you're in sort of foggy, foggy Berkeley-like state. Um, let's just start by talking about both yours and Monty's, your actual gardens, what's in it that's um, weird and strange or medicinal, <laughs> or all the things we've overlooked. Well, thank you, Rosie, and thank you, Monty, for uh, for doing this event, and 5 by 15 and Daisy. Uh, I'm just so happy to be among uh, my English friends uh, talking about plants and gardening. Um, so my garden this year is a little different. Uh, over the last couple of years since I started working on this book, I got interested in planting a lot of psychoactives. It's important to understand my garden is like a postage stamp compared to Monty's. Uh, I live on a city street in Berkeley and I have a, it's fenced in. Uh, so it has a lot of protection from the street and has some raised beds for vegetables and then a bunch of uh, zero scaping plants uh, because water is very precious here in California. Uh, so I save most of the water for my vegetables and fruit. Um, but this year I planted um, some plants I hadn't planted in a long time. Uh, one was the opium poppy, Papaver somniferum, which I've been sort of scared off planting by the government, uh, a story I tell in the book. Um, growing opium poppies is perfectly legal uh, with one exception. If you form the intention or in fact even have the knowledge, this is in the United States, it's, it's a little more civilized in, in Britain, if you have the knowledge that you are uh, manufacturing a scheduled controlled substance, in which case it's a felony. Um, so I'm not, I have no such intention, I hereby declare, and I'm growing them strictly for their beauty. And I was, I had forgotten just how extraordinary they are. So the garden is full of, I mean, even the vegetable garden is full of, of poppies, different kinds of poppies, and there's so many different kinds, and they are clearly beloved by honeybees. They're getting more attention than anything else in the garden. I also am growing cannabis, which is now legal to grow in, the United, in, in uh, California and in 18 other states or 17 other states. I, I'm not a big user of cannabis, but I actually like the plant. Um, and it's a very kind of lusty grower. I mean, it just, you know, just takes off. It is, it, I see why it's called a weed. I had grown it in high school, uh, but not since then. Um, and now they're very sophisticated clones uh, that you can get that are extremely expensive as well. Um, I have a tea plant, uh, Camellia sinensis. Uh, I don't know how that'll do or whether it'll produce um, drinkable tea. Um, let's see, an Artemisia uh, plant, which is, you know, the, the, the chemical uh, in uh, absinthe uh, comes from uh, Artemisia absinthium. Um, oh God, let's see, what else do I have? Um, it'll come to me. Uh, I'm very bad at listing plants. Um, but uh, so I favored the psychoactives um, and, uh, and they're doing quite well. Uh, oh, and I, of course I have, um, I'm sorry, Wachuma or San yeah. Pedro, which is a cactus uh, much more obscure than peyote. Uh, it's illegal to grow peyote, so I'm not growing it right now. Um, 
But uh, San Pedro cactus is a columnar cactus. It, it grows really quickly here in California, comes from Peru and also produces mescaline and is perfectly legal to grow. It's just completely under the radar of the authorities. Um, and as it turns out, I, I see it growing all over California. And I don't know whether people are growing it ornamentally or there's a lot of mescaline ingestion I just haven't been <laughs> invited to. So what, what's in your garden, Monty, that, that potentially well, I'm, I'm feeling slightly, I'm feeling slightly pedestrian, really. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's full of opium poppies, which, which as Michael points out, is, is, is not an issue, really, in, in here. Um, no doubt, if you processed opium and, uh, and dealt with it, then that would become something else. But no one blames the plant. It's, there's, there's no <laughs> legal connection with that. Um, and they're beautiful. I mean, exquisitely beautiful. And we keep the seeds and we scatter them and they grow. But the interesting thing that's happened this year is we bit the bullet and, and ripped out all our box hedging because it got so badly hit by blight and it was looking worse and worse. So we, we took it all out. And in the jewel garden, when Sarah and I made it, it which would have been 1997, to get it going, we got handfuls of poppy seed and just scattered them. And it filled with poppies that first year, and it was a joy. And then that following uh, early spring, we planted the box hedging. And when we took the box out, obviously there were seeds from those first poppies under the, where the hedging had been. They were exposed to light. So wherever there was hedging, we have these rows of poppies oh. making poppy hedges. And so the ghost of those poppies, I mean, they have been waiting for... 20 odd years, more, 24, 25 years, to see the light and germinate. And that, that actually, curiously, I find very moving. You know, it's, it's a very tender thing that these plants have waited and waited, and now they've come out into the light, and they're very beautiful. So, so that struck a, a distinct note. But I mean, we have hemlock growing, and it grows all along the fields, desperately poisonous. I have a herb garden full of herbs, which we use to a degree. But one of the things that struck me not so much specifically about this book, but about, about the attitude, is that when we bought this house, which was in 1991, had been lived in by the same person since 1919. And her mother had lived in it before that. And she always said that her mother's pharmacy was the hedgerow. Mm -hmm. And whenever she wanted any medicine, she just went to the hedgerow and took a plant and took a you know, decoction or whatever. And, and all her medicines came from either the garden or the hedge. And that just isn't happening now. People vaguely pay lip service to it, but I know of no one who seriously uses their garden for pharmaceutical purposes. I'm, and I'm not talking about, um, you know, the more esoteric things. I'm talking about gargling for a sore throat or a headache or, you know, whether it be your piles or your athlete's foot or whatever it might be. There is a plant that was used that is really easy to grow and available in most gardens that was used. And that's died back. And I think there's very interesting conversation to be had about our relationship with plants. We've become scared of plants. How do you mean scared? Well, I think um, we've, we've become generally more remote from the natural world. Um, we've become anxious about them. I get lots of questions, you know, will this kill my cat? Will this harm my dog? Will this give me eczema? Will I, you know, if I, well, I mean, obviously we, we become aware of the potential for harm that we think exists alongside beauty. And that's a double bind because as well as being anxious about harm, I mean, I'm not, I tend not to be anxious about any plants other than perhaps uh, animals eating you and me eating hemlock. Those are the two things that I worry about. But um, this idea that in the beauty lurks hidden danger. And, and I think that that has become, I, I've noticed it in my sort of career in the last 30 odd years that I've been writing and, and broadcasting about gardens, people are mistrustful. They're uncertain of themselves. Whereas my parents' generation, and certainly to a certain extent mine, you had knowledge, you did things, you just did it. It wasn't a problem. You relate, you know, you, you went and washed your hands if you touched the things and, and that was it. And occasionally you got a bit sick, but it wasn't a big deal. Do you agree? Well, I think also, I mean, I think that's true. I think people know so much less about plants, you know, mm. and, and knowledge about plants is usually not about their uses. It's about their, what they need to grow and their habits and, and their appearance. But gardens for a very long time were all about medicine. 
the mm -hmm. physic garden was, you know, was uh, that's why you had a garden. And and the and people's concern then was with the power of plants more than their beauty, for example. And I think that's what you kind of recover when you bring these psychoactives back into your garden and, and this memory that plants are not these benign things. Um, I mean, some of them are dangerous, but I mean, I agree, people are kind of paranoid because of their lack of knowledge, um, but that they have the power to change what goes on in our minds. Some of them have the power to kill us. Um, and, but we should be able to walk among them comfortably. And if you know that, and you know this one does this and this one does that, there are so many um, opportunities in the garden for um, uh, ingestion <laughs> for this one reason or another. And so I think we've kind of limited ourselves in what we look to in the garden and they can do a lot more for us um, and that they can be a pharmacy and they can take the place of the, you know, the drug dealer. And there, you know, there's, um, uh, plants are incredibly powerful. And um, we've, we've, we failed to see that, I think. You, do, you talk a lot about, obviously, caffeine as one of the substances. I mean, it's fascinating how the, how the Industrial Revolution and the whole economy has, how caffeine has worked its way in. Well, caffeine is one of the most powerful plants in the sense of it has changed more human minds, I think. I mean, it's not a plant, obviously, but it's produced by coffee and tea and uh, cacao and cola nuts. There's several plants that produce it. But that plant chemical um, is, uh, is ubiquitous. It's 90% of our species has a daily relationship uh, with caffeine, which is quite remarkable. It's, it's you know, default consciousness for, for many of us. And what's interesting is why is the plant doing this? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in our symbiotic relationship with plants and how they change us and we change them. And we, we focus too much on how we change them. We domesticate, we breed this wonderful new rose. Um, and yes, we exert our power over plants, but it's a two way street and, and their genius. And in this, they exceed ours is to produce chemicals with the power to change the minds of mammals and either attract them or repel them because plants can't move around. So they've come up with this whole other evolutionary strategy that involves chemical manipulation. And um, some of them do it, uh, you know, to keep other plants from growing near them or to, uh, you know, thwart insects. But they're also doing it for very specific reasons, which is to say to get noticed and get this, you know, this species that travels so much and has all this other kind of, has mobility and ingenuity to take their seeds and their genes around the world. And caffeine, when caffeine hit on the strategy of stimulating animals, um, it was very good news for that plant. Uh, coffee, coffee got moved from, um, uh, you know, uh, Africa and the Arab world, all over the tropical world, and tea got moved from China to, you know, another band that goes around the world. Um, so these are brilliant evolutionary strategies in which we are the, the willing um, dupes. I was thinking, Michael, that actually an awful lot of your work over the last 20, 30 years has been about the relationship of plants to people, isn't it? It's, Absolutely. It's, and and Obviously, one of the interesting things is, is that you focus, well, not, not entirely, because we'll talk about it later, the, the whole um, mental side, but you focus a lot on the physical effects. There's a lot of work going on in the UK, or a lot of attention and talk about the mental health benefits of plants and gardening in particular, um, and under the general umbrella of mental well-being. But that's very rarely, in, certainly to laymen, talked about in specific physical terms, which is, of course, why your book is it's so fascinating. Um, and I was completely enthralled by your analysis of the whole rise of capitalism and, and focus and the way that the mindset changed. I mean, arguably, the Enlightenment was powered by caffeine and, and the Industrial Revolution. And, and I speak as someone who absolutely has existed on caffeine since the age of five. I, and, and like you, I gave it up once and hated every second of, of its absence, you know, and, <laughs> and, and just felt life was too short. Um, but that, that's completely fascinating uh, anyway, the, the story. And we don't think of that as part of our engagement with the natural world. 
that yeah. we are taking in something nature produces, this wonderful gift um, we take into our bodies. It changes us, allows us to do things we weren't able to do before. And, and we so often think of our relationship to nature as, as, as a spectator sport, you know, essentially it's something we watch and admire, but it's much more intimate than that. And that these plants are working on us. And um, at the same time, we're working on them. And, um, and that relationship is just, I find incredibly satisfying and, and humorous in various ways, because sometimes we don't get the better of it. And, um, uh, and that when we, when we talk about engaging with the natural world, we have to realize this happens on our plates also. This happens, mm. you know, we, there, there's this traffic, you know, between but, you know, our bodies and their bodies. And also our minds and their minds, which I, I, I mean, I often feel that when I'm gardening well, where I end and the garden begins is, is an unknowable sort of liminal space. And I flow between the two. Um, which is a, a sort of transcendental experience on a daily mm -hmm. basis. Um, and I think that can happen. I don't think that, you, you know, you don't need to ingest anything to do that. I think that the, 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 the mental and spiritual relationship with plants works as well as the physical. And I think that there's, and I suspect that there aren't many people who have spent a reasonable amount of time in a garden, in, deeply involved in it at any level, who hasn't experienced that. However, they may articulate it is that that moment where yeah uh, and i think that that you know that the power of that that that's not accidental is what i'm saying is i think that completely keys in with what you're saying on a physical uh, and chemical level is yeah. that works on our minds too and our spirits and our souls and our emotions I completely agree. Um, and that gardens, all gardens are psychoactive in that sense, yeah. whether you ingest anything or not. Yeah. Um, in that they are special privileged spaces and they have characters in them that we call plants and they mm -hmm. change how we feel. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone has had that sense of walking out into a garden and feeling something lift from their shoulders or feeling some kinship with nature they didn't feel before. But I have to say, Monte, that um, a pinch of psychedelic can can increase that sense. Um, I, I'm sure. I had, well, a, uh, I had an experience, um, which I described in How to Change Your Mind, my last book, of having taken some psilocybin, magic mushrooms. And what you're describing, I mean, I you may have easier access to it without the use of any chemical, but for me, I had never had the sense that I had that afternoon of being one species among many in the garden and that the plants were all returning my gaze in some sense and that they were subjects just as I was. I think we're, we're all too often when we're in nature, we are the subject. We, mm. we are the, 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 the creature with agency and perspective. And, um, but it, of course, all creatures have a subjectivity. They have a, a, a kind of personhood. They have a set of interests. And we know this intellectually, but we don't feel it. We feel that we that they are objects that we can act on. And on this particular afternoon, they were more alive than they had ever been. They were, they had a, a viewpoint. They they were, as I said, they were returning my gaze, and it was such a powerful and and ecstatic moment for me. And can you access that again? Can you can you you sort of follow that through and and use that? Yeah, I, I mean, it, one of the, there, there's a kind of a residue or afterglow of those experiences that I think informs how you walk through a garden now. And certainly when I walk through that garden, this is my garden in Connecticut, um, that I have a, I look at the plants a little differently ever since then. And, I mean, and they, they have more, um, more character than they had before. I realize I felt that most of my life. That, that experience. I had one experience when I was um, 17. I, I don't know, I may have told you this, I, I think Rosie said, is, is I was gardening and I'd gardened all my childhood because I had to and it was a chore and I didn't really enjoy it, but I, I learned about it. It was, it was something the family did, you know, it'd be like being brought yeah. up on a farm, you know, that sort of idea. Um, and <clears throat> I was sowing seed and I had a very profound experience of, of holding the seed in my hand and the soil was warm. And an overwhelming sense of everything in the world was there in my hand. Everything that ever existed, that I could ever want, that ever could be, was right there at that moment. 
and it was a sense of complete bliss, but the overriding thing was, was an absence of desire because everything was there. There was yeah. nothing to want. And I didn't know how to use that experience. I mean, it was, it was, it was uncalled for. I hadn't sought it in any way, but I then had a dream whereby my hands became roots and went down deep into the ground. And I remember waking, feeling completely refreshed and, and whole and, and just entire. And those two experiences, um, I have really formed the rest of my life, you know, and, and they were, uh, and I, I mean, I, many, many, many years ago, I did um, use some psychedelics very rarely, but I remember it wasn't a particularly, I, I stopped because it actually had, it was very scary. Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember loss of ego was, was too profound and too difficult. And, and, and you know, it was, it was not something I wished to repeat. Um, but the benign experiences of complete dissolution in so much that I became them and they became me without losing anything, without, lo and, and really importantly, without losing access to all the other things. Whereas I think yeah. one of the things that's scary about psychedelics for a lot of people is you can't get back. You can, yeah. you can go through a door, but not back. It closes behind you. And I think that we, my point is, is that that is in you. You, you just have to access it. And I agree. It's in you. I mean, yeah. there's nothing in the drugs. Um, yeah. they're, they're just catalysts. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah. you had that in your mind. I had it in my mind, but I needed that catalyst to yeah. bring it forward. Um, and to, I, I, I had it in my mind as an intellectual matter. I understood that mm. plants had a point of view and a set of interests mm. and agency. Um, it's hard for us to see sometimes. It takes a leap of the imagination. You know, they're, they're so slow compared to us, you know? I mean, that's one of the reasons time-lapse photography is so powerful. You know, those mm. da David Attenborough uh, videos of, of mm. vines and things, and suddenly you have a sense of them as actors in, in the drama that you're not the only actor in the drama, but we live in a different dimension. And so there's, there's a leap that has to be made into, the, into plant consciousness. And um, uh, you're very fortunate how, how, what easy access you have. And it may have to do with the fact you spend a lot more time in the garden than I do. Um, and uh, it, is, you know, yeah. it is about familiarity too. So I wanted to ask you, Michael, and, and you, Monty, that, that there's a lot in your book about the kind of spirituality and the numbers of religions, for want of a better word, over the centuries that have had very intimate relationships with psychedelics. And it, it kind of made me wonder sort of what came first? You know, did, did humans want this? Did plants, you know, why did that happen? Why did a plant arrive that could actually alter your consciousness? I mean, Monty is clearly very lucky that he seems to have a, a way of opening a door, um, which we would all really like. But I would that say they, they, they have this long history of being intertwined with faith. Yeah, well, humans have been using plants to change consciousness, you know, as long as they've been human. Um, psychedelics in particular, these, these very powerful consciousness changing plants have been used by uh, many, many traditional societies. Um, so, uh, mescaline appears to be the oldest, at least that we have in the archeological record. It's about 6,000 years it's been used in the new world. Uh, psilocybin too, used for a very long time. We don't know how long. Um, and what's curious is that we humans should desire these states of transcendence. Um, you know, if you think about it, they're kind of dangerous. Mm. Um, you, you can overdose on drugs, uh, although not the classic psychedelics necessarily, but on many other drugs, uh, opium, for example. Um, you're more prone to accidents. You're less uh, aware of your environment and therefore more likely to be attacked. Um, so you would think that the drug takers would have been edited out of evolution by natural selection, that they're, that they're taking these risks but they haven't been. And that suggests that there is something to be gained, that, the, that these substances have contributed something to our evolution, at least our cu cultural evolution. And I think that's the case. Um, There's some obvious benefits to uh, some of these plant garden plants, such, such as opium. I mean, we, we, we associate opium now with this you know, horrible crisis and, and the deaths of what, 800,000 people in the United States since the late 90s when I first wrote about it. Um, but 
opium is also a blessing. It's a blessing to people who are dying. It's a blessing to people having their wisdom teeth removed. Um, you know, surgery would be unbearable without opiates um, in the aftermath. Um, so I think it's important to remember that, you know, these, these things are blessings and curses uh, at the same time. And we have to hold these two contradictory ideas in our heads and that it all depends on intention and dose and, 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 and setting and set um, whether these things are positive or negative. The value of the psychedelics in particular, I think has to do with the way they disrupt uh, certain minds in ways that's, that um, uh, create what are essentially mutations in cultural evolution. If, 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 if biological evolution um, relies on genes and you know, radiation and mutagens of various kinds create mutations in genes, most of which are dangerous and useless and get edited out. But every now and then one turns out to be a great adaptation and it enters the stream and, and is carried forward in time. Um, well, something similar happens in cultural evolution. There are memes, there are you know, ideas and metaphors and beliefs. And the encounter of certain psychedelic molecules with certain human minds produces variation, I mean, new ideas, new memes, most of which are stupid and will be discarded. But every now and then something really useful and powerful comes along. And I think a lot of these have been in the religious context um, that people have had visions on psychedelics that they then share uh, with their communities. Visions of an afterworld, an afterlife, an underworld, a beyond. Um, these very powerful ideas which you see popping up in all different religions, um, where do they come from? How would, how would people ever conceive of the idea of a, of a world that you can't see, that's, mm -hmm. that, that there's another world? Um, well, one explanation is through these kind of experiences, through ingesting these powerful plants. And, and having done that, these individuals have contributed to changes that are still with us today. I mean, some of these encounters happened probably thousands of years ago. So I think that um, psychedelics in particular and drugs in general have been um, forces of change in cultural evolution. And, um, and it's a history lost to us, you know, and there's a lot of speculation in this, but I, I, you know, I believe there's a natural history to the imagination, to the human imagination. Uh, everything is a natural history. And, um, and I think that these, these psychoactives have played a very important role in that natural history. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, I want to obviously stress that, that they are acting as triggers. They're, they're, not, they're not creating it, they're simply accessing it. I mean, one of the things that yeah. I thought was very interesting is this idea that a, a lot of our behavior and thought processes is based on experience, that we learn that certain things happen and therefore we preempt what might happen based on what we've learned is likely to happen. Yeah. Whereas when you're a child, you don't know what's gonna happen. So you get in a car and it might take off and fly away. It might turn into uh, something purple and fluffy. It might go along a road, you know, it's time has no meaning. We can even, most of us can remember being in a car and what seemed like a really long journey and we do it as an adult and it was 15 minutes or something or, yeah. or whatever. So that it's this idea that we, we close everything down based upon experience. We, we shut her out, all the possibilities that are less likely. And it seems one of the things that, that psychedelics do is, is simply remove those barriers and say, actually, lots of things are possible. And that interests me very much in relationship to, to plants and gardens in the general day-to-day -day element, is that gardening by definition is, what, well, it has tended to be, not necessarily by definition, but certainly has, has become through historically a process of imposing parameters, of blocking out nature, of, of controlling it and, and steering it and in many ways restricting it. And there are lots of good reasons for that in terms of, of, of uh, threat and danger and, and, and also the need to control, the, the pleasure you get from controlling. I mean, if we, we look at our screens behind you as a very orderly space, I have bookshelves with books on it, we need to do that. But it's clearly limiting 
it's clearly creatively, uh, by definition, limiting. And that, uh, it, I mean, whether one could apply the, the sort of uh, psychedelic experience to creation where you say, actually, no, it doesn't have to be like that. It could do anything. You know, we, we, could, we could make this happen in different ways. And probably it will be a mistake and won't work, but it might not be. It might be interesting. I think that's a fascinating idea, that, that, that unlocking our preconceptions. And God knows in England, w those preconceptions are so fixed. I mean, our, our gardening establishment is by default very conservative. <laughs> well, this is the, you know, this is the kind of disruption that these, that mm. these molecules can, can cause. And, and I agree. I mean, I think especially as we get older, we get trapped in these kind of uh, expectations that this is the way things have to be. This is how they were last time. Um, and that there is this, this is adult consciousness in a way. It's very efficient. It has its uses. You know, we all have by now uh, developed algorithms to deal with any given situation, whether it's in the garden or in, in a family dispute or, you know, in our careers, we kind of know the moves and that saves us a lot of trouble because, um, Children do think very differently. They try everything. They, they literally think outside the box. And, um, and that's wasteful in one way, but it's the essence of creativity in another, um, which is to say throwing out expectations. And as you say, experimenting, trying it this way, trying it that way. There's a, um, a psychologist I interviewed for the book who, who, who speaks of two kinds of consciousness. One is spotlight consciousness uh, and the other is lantern consciousness. Spotlight consciousness is highly focused um, and- Fueled uh, by caffeine. And, and definitely aided by caffeine and yeah. uh, not aided by psychedelics. Um, yeah. And you can toggle between these two different kinds of consciousness depending on what sorts of chemicals you're ingesting because mm -hmm. uh, while caffeine does sharpen that, that spotlight, psychedelics appears to blur it and, and bring back into your consciousness all those other uh, possibilities, um, the perceptions that you know come from you know from out of left field, um, you know that it, it disables those confident predictions that you're describing, which is neuroscience is called predictive coding, and the fact that we don't actually perceive very much. It's not a uh, we're not our senses are not windows taking in information from the environment our brains, it's, it's really an inside out phenomenon. Our brains are predicting what we're seeing uh, and then we're correcting for any errors. Um, so it's a generative process, it's, it's imagination. Uh, Anil Seth calls it you know, a controlled hallucination of reality. And that's all very efficient. Um, on the other hand, we're missing a lot. There's so much more going on. Um, and, and our senses and our perceptions evolved not to take in reality as it is, but to take in exactly what we need to, to thrive. And, and that is, Aldous Huxley said, is a measly trickle of what's out there. And so one of the things that happens in the garden is when you open that aperture, you realize there's so much more going on here than you realize. And, um, and that's a thrilling thing. And you can do that obviously without drugs too, but, but as we get older, we, we sort of need, we need to be jogged out of that um, confident prediction that we're constantly making. I think one of the, the, the more sort of fascinating things that are emerging uh, f f as a result of, of sort of practical science is the way that A, the, the life in the soil of, of a, of a mind-boggling complexity that we literally haven't been able to imagine and, and can't because it's, it's too much. But, but you're, and also the interrelationship, usually on a fungal level, between trees and between other plants, um, which me, I mean, to, you stop and you think, and you're just, your head just throbs with the sort of possibilities of that and what's going on. Now, that is completely trippy. I mean, that is absolutely yeah. what you're talking about. But it's, it's fact and it's practical and it's real and it's happening, you know. And we've been blind to it, completely yeah. blind to it. You know, we see plants as individuals like us, yeah. you know. And yeah. of course, we see ourselves as more individual than we are. We yeah. too are very connected in ways we don't like to focus on. But yes, so plants, it turns out, are much more sociable than we ever knew. I mean, the, 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 it does, the, the downside of this is that 
by and large, I think that the Western world has increasingly become more and more remote from this kind of awareness, more and more deliberately um, divorced. And the internet, for example, which opens out all the possibilities of interconnecting in a way that was unimaginable 20 years ago, and certainly 30 or 40, um, actually has rather reduced people's learning. It's so just little tidbits, learn just enough to confirm what you think. Mm -hmm. And then, and then move on without any sort of balancing or in greater discovery. And I do feel that there's a lot of work to be done by you and to a certain extent by me and people like us who write and broadcast to give people the time and space to go deep, you know, to, and I'm interested, I mean, obviously that's a contradiction in terms of lateral, of, of lantern thinking is, is that, that the focus mind, we, when we go deep, we're thinking about clear study where, you know, we, we read all our books and we discover more and we write facts and we, you, you write articles and books and we, we broadcast stuff. But actually it's about absorbing this great breadth of information. And I, I don't know where that's going to come from. Maybe the next generation. I don't know. But people are hungry for it. I mean, I agree. We Our relationship to uh, plants and, and all species and nature in general has really become attenuated. But you see this this hunger for it, and you, you know, and the, you know, you books like the um, the Overstory um, uh, and uh, a Merlin Sheldrake's book uh, on um, Entangled Life on Mycelium. Um, there, there's a and and Suzanne Samard, who who pioneered all this work in communication between trees using mycelium mm -hmm. that you were alluding to. Um, these people are very. Um, since that I think they know they're missing something. Um, and I think mm -hmm. the psychedelic re renaissance has something to do with that also. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind, it's as, it's, it's far from digital experience as you could possibly go. Um, and, and that there is, I think there is, a, people have a sense that they're missing something and that they would like to recover it. And, and nature is, is available to help them do that. Yeah, I think it was also really, think, yeah. really interesting in Suzanne's book, the, the fact that she was said to work when she first started working. And the belief was that if you gave a plant a clear run at it, a survival of the fittest, that you stripped everything out and just stick, stuck it in. That in fact, that did not work for the trees, that the trees were much happier being in the community. And it seems to me that's a fantastic parable for our own last, in a way, 70 years since the end of the Second World War and when the farming system started and in a way society got so atomized and communities got atomized. And when you see now, it actually is underneath all of that, it's really beginning to turn. And people have, as you say, Michael, are figuring out what they've lost. And plants are a very big part of the story. Yeah, and they're just kind of a lot more intelligent than we've given them credit for, and a lot more sociable, a lot more communicative. Um, uh, I, you know, I, it's our arrogance. I think we've vastly underestimated um, uh, the complexity. And you, and you talk about the soil, Monty. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. this is this incredible wilderness that we have not mm -hmm. begun to understand the soil mm -hmm. microbiome and its role in plant health and in our health. I mean, it may well be that one of the reasons gardeners tend to live you know, to a ripe old age and uh, are, are healthy is that they are exposed to bacteria much more than sure. the average person today. Um, you know, to have your hands in the soil uh, is to enact a different relationship with the, the microbiome. And, and no doubt it has an effect on the microbiome in your body. I mean, these things are mirrored, right? There's a microbiome in your gut and there's one and, in the soil and, and one and affects in your the brain. Other. And I mean, and your, your, your yes. mental health is affected by the bacteria that, that, that you have in your gut, which research seems to show is directly affected by, by the bacteria in the soil, that ingesting that bacteria is your mental health. There's a reason want... people used to eat soil. Um, yeah, well, and, I mean, it cultures was... still do. Yeah. and and. If you grow your own vegetables or fruit, inevitably you ingest soil because however carefully yeah. you wash them, there will be soil in there and the bacteria. One thing I wanted to, to, to talk to you about a little bit, because I think the book covers this uh, very interestingly, is plants and addiction. Your addiction to caffeine, all our addiction to caffeine. Um, opium, I worked with uh, heroin addicts uh, quite a lot. And it was very interesting observing 
the addiction, I mean, the, the sort of the heroin was a sort of side effect, really. It was just a means of, of feeding the addiction. In fact, one of the interesting things was that they were as addicted to sugar mm -hmm. in many ways. I mean, sugar was a very serious addiction. Um, and uh, actually physically getting off heroin wasn't that big a deal. It was a mental thing of being an addict, um, as we know. But, you know, two of the plants in the book are very seriously connected to addiction and, our, and, and relationship to plants and how, and how you know, nicotine, uh, sugar, caffeine, opium, these are all plants uh, that, that tap into our addictive personalities. I, I'd be really interested to know sort of yeah. what you think so, about So, I that. mean, that is in a way their strategy, right? Um, by addicting us, they prosper. They get, mm -hmm. you know, they, they prosper in the sunshine of our attention. Um, but addiction is very complicated. And the more you look at it, um, the less it appears to have to do merely with chemistry um, and that it has to do with context and that, you know, we speak of addiction as a disease, but it, it may well be a symptom of a disease. Um, you know, in America, we have this opioid crisis and we have this mm -hmm. meth crisis. And if you look at the geography of that crisis, it's places where possibilities have shrunken over the last few years, where there are no jobs, where factories are closing, where, you know, these are truly deaths of despair in the case of the overdoses. Um, one of the most striking um, uh, parables of addiction, which is a scientific experiment, is the um, is the Rat Park experiment. Are you familiar with that? that um, a few years ago, a Canadian scientist um, was uh, had this idea. Um, a lot of what we know and and believe about addiction is based on what rats do in a cage when given the choice to administer heroin or cocaine and sugar water to their veins. And, um, and you put a rat in a cage by himself and they will press the lever and addict themselves and, and consume cocaine to the point of death. Um, and he thought, well, maybe there's a problem with the cage here. And uh, so this guy, Bruce Alexander, created a park-like cage, a large cage with toys, uh, greenery, um, uh, mates for the, for the rats to hang out with and have sex with, good food. And they didn't, they, they sampled the heroin, but they used like a fraction of as much and they didn't get addicted and, and they had other things to do. And that the, it, it was the condition of the cage that predicted the addiction more than the drug itself. And I think that that's, that has a lot to tell us about addiction um, and that Yes, there's a chemical involved. There are chemical hooks um, on certain on certain of these of these uh, molecules, but most people don't get addicted, and and we don't look at that. And I think it has a lot to do with the, the addiction is an adaptation. It's it's an attempt to medicate, um, and it's it's an attempt to give pleasure when there's very little pleasure on offer in a life. Well, I certainly know that the the, the, the thing I learned most about dealing with sort of very, very deeply addicted Fargo and heroin addicts is heroin was a painkiller. Yes. And that exactly. was its primary function. And, yeah, and, the, pain, the, and you know, pain of all kinds. Yeah, remove the pain and then you, re you remove, uh, maybe, maybe not the addiction, but you certainly remove the need for that particular drug. But I mean, it, that doesn't quite explain our addiction to caffeine, other than the plant's brilliance at, at, at making us want more. Yeah, well, our addiction to caffeine, I mean, caffeine is not a painkiller. No. Um, it, it, in a way, it's it is a, a focus. It is a incredible um, sort of waker up. I think you tell a story about how, you know, caffeine is terrible for sleep, but it's great for waking up. You know? Yes. It's, yes. It's, well, you know. caffeine is, a, it's, it's kind of a brilliant chemical in that it proposes itself as the solution to the problems it causes. Um, yeah. In that... <laughs> We yeah. feel sleepy because we're uh, we're withdrawing from caffeine. I mean, every night you you there is this cycle, and in the morning when you wake up, you are going through withdrawal symptoms, right? You're you're beginning to kick, and it doesn't feel good. You might have a headache. You might feel kind of muzzy. Um, and what do you do? Well, you take a cup of coffee, and you feel fine again. And um, and this. We're, you know, the, the drugs pharmacokinetics mesh perfectly with the, 
the human cycle of, of waking and sleeping. If, if, you, if it woke you up with withdrawal at two in the morning, it wouldn't work for the plant no. or for you. Um, so it's, it kind of meshes beautifully with, with um, human you know, circadian rhythms. Um, but I think that you know, we use it because it helps us do the things we think are important. Um, you know, I asked one of the researchers I interviewed, it, has caffeine been a boon or a bane to our species? And he said, well, it depends. It's been a boon to our civilization, but is that the same as being a boon to our species? And that depends on your values, finally. I mean, you know, to disconnect us from the rhythms of the sun so that we could work all night, is that a good or a bad thing? It's very good for capitalism. Is it good for us as a species? Um, that's a, it's a different question. But, but no I, I, question, I, I, it, it has advanced this project of, of capitalism. I mean, just the coffee break alone tells you all yeah. you need to know. But I of mean, course, that's an American thing. Is we don't have that, really. That's not inbuilt into our system. You don't uh, have coffee but, breaks. Well, no, well I mean, well, we do, tea? but they're not mandatory. We have tea breaks, but, but they tend to be... Well, unless I'm, I mean, you know, I may be totally out of touch, but tea breaks by different tend to be people say, let's have a cup of tea rather than it's tea break time and, and everybody stop work and put down. So in the office, so in offices and factories, there's not time off to. Well, to I've drink. never worked in an office or a factory, okay. but. but uh, Rosie, can um, you help us here? <laughs> well, I, I think it's really interesting in your book how, you, you know, you say that the tea became the drink of the working classes and that you could keep people in factories for much longer, but you did give them a kind of tea break. That became part yeah. of your union rules that you got 15 minutes off to have a cup of tea. tea and it was yeah. a cheaper version okay. of caffeine from the coffee, which became posher at a certain point. And you had all the coffee houses yeah. in London that were enormous part of our culture. It's, you know, it's quite an institution. The idea that your employer would give you a drug and then yes. paid time in which to enjoy it. Um, I mean, it sort of tells you all you need to know on, you know, who's, who's benefiting from this. Um, and I tell the history of the company that started it in, uh, yeah. in the United States. Um, but it's also, you know, this addiction is different than some others in that it doesn't, lead to, um, I mean, there are people who can function on heroin and there are people who can function on caffeine, but, but there's often a, a, a kind of a spiral, um, largely due to the fact that, you know, obtaining it is a problem because it's illegal and uh, there's contamination of needles and disease that accompanies it. Um, a lot of the harms are due to the fact it's illegal. Um, in the case of caffeine, you know, I looked very hard at the downsides. You know, we tend to moralize all drugs. Um, and, and so I, you know, what's the problem with this addiction? Mm. And there isn't much of one. I mean, from a health point of view, um, there's coffee and tea are highly protective against certain kinds of cancer, Parkinson's disease, cardiovascular disease, dementia. Um, the only serious negative uh, appears to be disturbance of the sleep cycle. And if you have caffeine in your body, when you go to bed, your deep sleep, this slow wave sleep, which is a very important part of your mental hygiene is disturbed. And, and that can have health effects. Um, but, you know, if you stop early in the, you know, if you don't have caffeine past noon, um, and I know in, in England, that's not realistic. Um, I say. <laughs> the benefits are greater than the, um, uh, than the risks. I once, uh, about 25 years ago, I got caffeine poisoning. Oh. And interestingly, from uh, drinking instant coffee, which up until then I thought was very low in caffeine, but in fact, it the opposite, it's, yeah. it's high and opposite is true. And it was a deeply unpleasant experience. I was, I'd got in the habit of drinking I suppose about six or seven mugs a day of instant coffee. And it was early in the morning, I had a friend to stay and we had a couple of cups of coffee, you know, for breakfast. He had to go and get a train and I drove him to the train. And as I drove him, I thought, well, I feel weird. Almost as though my coffee had been spiked. You know, I feel uh -huh. like this is, this is very strange. Uh, you know, I hope I'm going to be able to drive home. And I felt stranger and stranger and I got home and there was no one else at home. And I sat in a chair thinking, I wonder what's going to happen next, but whatever it is, I don't, don't like this very much. And then my heart began racing. Uh, I felt I couldn't move or speak. 
uh, and that if I just sat very still, I, I might be okay for the next five minutes, but I thought, oh, well, do I ring wow. an ambulance or whatever? And that lasted for about, the intense phase lasted for about an hour. Horrible. And then I felt bad for about three days and it was caffeine poison. And I went to the doctor and, and that's what he, so I, I didn't drink any for about three months. And since then I've only at home had one cup a day. Mm -hmm. I have one very strong cup, but, but, and I crave it. I mean, I'm addicted to it. I want it. Are you still drinking I drink, instant coffee? No, I haven't touched instant yeah. coffee since that day. Um, yeah. I have, so, and I, I actively don't like it as a drink. Um, but I, but I drink tea all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, like every other Englishman, I, I exist on tea. Uh, and the thought of not drinking tea after 12 o'clock is a joke. I mean, you know, we, we, we all yeah. drink tea in the afternoon. I'm with you. Uh, <laughs> so, with but, you. but the point was, there was a real downside. It was that that particular drug really was a very unpleasant experience. Well, you know how happen. powerful it is then. Um, yeah. And, you know, and all these studies, the health effects, they say once you get up to seven or eight cups, all bets are off. It increases yeah. risk of depression and suicide. Yeah, yeah. So you well, were in the danger zone there for caffeine. I was. And yet um, I was, you know, I I regarded it as a kind of just like drinking tea, you know, it's just something you yeah. drank. And all, but I thought what's so terribly interesting about your book was something I hadn't really thought through is, of course, without coffee, and, until coffee and tea came along, hot drinks were very much the exception rather than the rule. They were you know, the first hot drinks, and, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, it, it, you, and that's why societies that em embrace them did so well, because as a public yeah. health measure, getting people yeah. to, to drink a boiled drink was the healthiest yeah. thing you could give them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before that, people drank a lot of alcohol because that was safer than water. Um, mm. And water was the dangerous thing to drink. But um, I think the societies that embrace coffee and tea thrived in part because um, it reduced the chances of bacterial infection. Okay, on that note, I'm gonna bring in some questions because we've got loads. So there's a really interesting question here from someone called Catherine Matt saying, listening to Monty and Michael reflect on gardening as both order and potentially chaos of creativity. I'm wondering to what extent they think that gardening is different or perhaps the same to other forms of human creativity like the arts oh well i think it's I, I think it's both alike and different um the your materials have their own interests that's not true when you're oil painting i mean there are tendencies in a certain color right there are tendencies but but the plants have their own agenda and you're and you're trying to govern that agenda to a certain extent but there's always this element of wildness of, of what you can't control. And that's kind of the excitement of it too. So in that sense, I, I think it's unlike, I mean, I guess someone who's, I don't know, choreographing a bunch of people is dealing with the fact that they all have their interests too. So maybe it's more like choreography. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Monty? Well, I've, I've thought about this a lot because it's, it's not a new question. I, I think that gardening, uh, can be uncreative. In other words, it's perfectly possible to garden as a craft, um, as a very skillful craft, without much creativity. Um, on the other hand, I think that it can be as creative as any other art form, mm -hmm. partly because um, it's an expression of, of making things up. You're using a material and you're creating something that wasn't there before. It's different in the sense, exactly as you point out, your materials are different. I mean, if you're using clay or you're carving wood or stone, that has a life. It has a life that is real. And, and you have to, if you can't respond to it, you won't do any good work. Right. Um, and I think there is a connection with that. But, and I think the fact that, say, wood, for example, has lived as a tree or that, that stone has been created by organic uh, matter. Uh, um, I mean, you know, whether it be limestone, for example, that's made out of living creatures, I think comes through. And I think you have to be aware of that. But you're dealing with so many different things. I, I think the main difference, the, the big difference, is that gardening is always transitory. Yeah. There is no, you cannot time. fix it at all. Time yeah. is the big element. Yeah. Is that and that, it's, and that it's, distinguishes it. The nearest thing I ever saw to it, I was in Beijing, uh, at the summer palace and it was a very very misty morning 
and old men uh, writing poems on the ground, on the, on the paving with water. Now mm. that was gardening. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the, the, for, just for a few moments, there were beautiful words and then they went and they and were there gone. We yeah. yeah, beautiful. So someone else has asked here, um, which, which was actually I, I wanted to ask too, because we started off by both of you saying that people are now more scared of plants than previous generations, which is really depressing when you think about it. So how can we, how can we encourage people to develop better relationships and how to heal themselves through plants? I mean, Monty, it's something that, I mean, I know you get massive audiences for Gardener's World and it always does seem that it's, it does do that. It does, although, I mean, the, the truth be told, we, there is quite a lot of um, careful, not censorship, that's, that's too strong a word, but control of the information we put out lest we cause anxiety or, or, or people read things wrongly and go off and harm themselves in some way and we qualify things. I think the answer, as Michael said, it's, it's knowledge. It's just knowledge and familiarity is the more you know about something, the more you trust it. If, if, if you know, I use a chainsaw quite often. Chainsaws are really dangerous and you should treat mm. them with great respect. On the other hand, you can use them uh, for years and years and all day long doing really difficult, dangerous things safely because you know what you're doing. You know how it works and you, you treat it with respect. It's the same with plants. You know, very, very few plants are as dangerous as any chainsaw. Um, but but you, you just need to know about them, know what they do and integrate them into your life. And I think it's fine. And, and there are plenty of other things we do which are much more dangerous. People get in a car, you know, they um, walk, they go up and down stairs. That's very dangerous. So another good question from Eva Ontiveros is about, you know, witches, which obviously were women who used plants and who, who were able to terrify people by what they could do with plants. Was that part of our fear of them, Michael, our loss of connection with them? Well, that goes back to this time when we saw plants as powerful, as really powerful. And um, remember, we didn't, you know, that was chemistry. There wasn't a lot of other chemistry, right? And that was healing. And, um, and it could be used in a positive way to heal, or it could be used to, you know, make people sick. I mean, the witches were very interested in psychoactive plants. The, um, uh, you know, the witch's broom, uh, that metaphor is apparently based on the way witches would administer psychoactives to themselves using a dildo. The broom is a dildo. And I know it's kind of shocking. And, uh, and they would make these potions and they, they would, uh, you know, apply them vaginally. And um, so witches, witches had the, the deepest knowledge of plants in a way. And, 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 and I suppose that this special knowledge was frightening to other people. Um, and, you know, we've had drug wars before this drug war. <laughs> wow. I, I think the key to that though, is that, that, is that if you believe a plant can powerfully heal, by the same token, it must be able to powerfully uh, yes. cause illness. And it's as simple as that. The yes, dose I'm, makes the poison, as Paracelsus yeah. told us. Yeah. yeah. Yes. No. The, when we at Machu Picchu, they have a herb garden there where they grow a lot of datura, and they use the they used to use the datura to do brain surgery. And you, the guide was very um, straightforward about how many experiments had gone wrong before they figured out the exact dose that yes. you could tell one to keep mm -hmm. them out for three days. And you know, and yeah. so you could see that that was a fantastic fine line that people were on. <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes they got wrong. <laughs> yes. Anyway, both of you, I mean, we're up to time now. And thank everybody for not whizzing off to watch the football. Um, who were, everyone will be drinking masses of beer and wine made from plants, the acceptable form of uh, drugs. Um, and um, But anyway, Michael's book is fantastic. This Is Your Mind on Plants is available now through all good bookstores, um, through Newham Books. And thank you so much for being with us. And Monty, all of Monty's books are wonderful. I particularly have enjoyed The American Gardens and My Garden World, which I absolutely loved and go back to a lot just to read about that particular month and all that's going on and what I should be looking for. So thank you both very much indeed. And congratulations against Michael, again, Michael, for 
your book, which is published in the UK tomorrow. And I think you'll have a lot of extra readers. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you both. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Monty. Thank you. And I look forward to doing this in person soon. I Michael, really I hope so. Yes, we can have a big selection of plants. Excellent. I'm, I'm okay, looking God. forward to showing thank you the changes in the garden, Michael. Very yeah. nice to I see you, wait. albeit yeah. uh, digitally. All Great right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.